Okay, we've got Bart on the line to talk to us about tracking tools and how you know maybe they bait you a little bit and they may not always be the go-to solution. Bart, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thanks a lot, Darren. Uh, and welcome everyone to my talk. Um, so I was saying that uh, we don't, in my opinion, have enough sort of um, strategic conversations about the place of tracking um, and, uh, and, and how the methods and, um, and, and, and um, the industry, the ecosystem as a whole sort of influences the way that we do business. And um, I think humans plus robots is, is the right way to go. In other words, uh, data plus, um, plus a human uh, interpretation of the data rather than relying blindly on automated systems. Um, in order to, uh, to sort of make this case, I'll talk about uh, how we got to the current situation in this whole ecosystem of online advertising and beyond uh, tracking and so on. Um, what is the current situation and where do we go from now? Um, I hope you will, uh, you will bear with me a bit uh, as I will take some detours and I will do some... Uh, some storytelling in the interest of, uh, of, of, of making a point. Um, first, though, uh, just um, maybe 30 seconds about the company that I work for. Uh, we're an international marketing agency uh, with offices in Denmark, Poland, and Hong Kong, uh, and various places around the world. Um, we, uh, we mostly help uh, mid-market firms and larger uh, with their SEO, with their paid advertising, um, their their strategy, um, and the the measurement side of things, and it was really this uh, combination of things that uh, made it very clear that a lot of companies are struggling with uh, with with uh, the subject, whether they know it or not. Uh, many of the conversations that we had, and so this is um, why we're talking about the subject that we're talking about today. Uh, I personally uh, am a partner and owner at Media Group. Um, I mostly work on the more nerdy stuff, uh, as well as strategy and uh, and staffing and so on. And I worked at Citibank and uh, uh, Saxo Bank before that. Um, those are both in the online trading industry. And I think uh, it's just interesting to mention that the online trading industries are uh, high dollar values, very high competition a lot of sophistication, a lot of regulation and technology that is required. And so I think this is a perfect um, uh, industry to sort of uh, apply lessons to, to other places as well. Um, so without further ado, how did we get to the situation that, uh, that we're in right now? Um, so I think it's a story about incentives. Uh, that's kind of the behavioral economics way of looking at things, but it, it's really quite clear if you think about things in online marketing. Um, but to begin with, online advertising was, was based on, on impressions mostly. Um, so the quality of those impressions didn't really matter so much. The incentive was to get as many eyeballs as possible. And because of this, media quality really suffered. Um, Marketers then started to measure clicks on their ads as a way to, to judge response. So again, an incentive was to create ads that got clicks no matter what. Um, some of you that are a little bit older and were around for the internet back then, um, they, uh, they have seen the, the ads like the one I'm showing here, but also interactive games and so on. And really the only purpose was to get you to go to, um, to uh, click on that. Um, we got large, confusing, irrelevant ads that are more and more uh, intrusive. Marketers then realized that clicks in themselves are not really that, that great, uh, no shit. Uh, they started to focus more on audiences. Um, initially, we did that through media titles, but there are only so many readers of quality publications like the New York Times or the FT and so on. Um, so <clears throat> there was an incentive for publishers or ad tech companies to sort of decouple publications from audiences. Um, so what I mean with that is uh, they went, wait a second, you're paying this much money for that person to see an ad on Bloomberg.com. But this same person also goes to Yahoo or, or other uh, sites with lower quality content. Why is there such a delta? Because it's, again, it's the same person. Well, it's conveniently sort of neglected the idea of uh, the media as the message and a lot of other things that, uh, you know, I, I'll kind of skip over now. But um, because of this, this idea, targeting using data was born. 
uh, marketers started to realize that clicks don't mean anything. They started to measure conversions. The tech sort of caught up to that. And again, an incentive was to focus advertising only on those people ready to convert already. So you're kind of interjecting yourself in the journey. You're focusing on doing uh, stuff that um, that gets in front of people that were kind of ready to, to, to purchase something. Search advertising, retargeting success, and, and a, a lot of other stuff online is largely based on this. Um, the question that, that everyone should ask themselves is, would those conversions have happened anyway? Are those people that, um, that, that have been influenced in other ways before, um, what, what are we actually driving in additional business? Those are very difficult questions. Um, so, so then we were in a situation where, uh, for instance, a person was, uh, you know, saw a print ad, clicked on a banner, searched and converted, um, many such uh, potential uh, paths can be taken, but which channel is responsible? The incentive for advertising channels is to all claim credit, um, especially if you were the last one to touch them, they're like, look, it was my ad that got you the, the, the conversion, the sale or whatever. The incentive for advertisers is to focus on that last chance, uh, touch channel too, because mostly, let's be honest, it's easier to explain to your boss. Um, if uh, you have a very nuanced picture of like, yeah, I know that uh, this channel got the majority of last click conversions, but we see a lot of interactions with this ad and people will get familiar with it and, and whatever, like, okay, where's the data? Show me how this influences uh, uh, actual conversions and so on. It's just a much easier conversation uh, and it's for themselves also easier strategically to focus on um, on, on, on last click and, uh, and, and conversions uh, in this way. Um, using this approach, and we saw this many times, results kind of lagged. Um, there are a lot of other uh, considerations and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, seeing that online advertising didn't drive that much incremental business, um, marketers started to think, at least in some cases, about attribution more. Uh, attribution is um, sort of uh, what part of the credit of a conversion uh, should go to which uh, uh, channel, which, which tactic that you're using. And uh, through various models, uh, mathematics, and so on, it would kind of unpick the relevant contribution of each. Um, some marketers use those models to perhaps rightly justify spending more on awareness and drive business through the acquisition funnel. But a lot of this uh, required a lot of data. And the incentive was for everyone to create a sort of digital data gold rush, collect as much as possible, get it all into a database. Um, and that wasn't very healthy, as we'll see later on as well. So that brings us in my opinion, to our current situation. Again, the previous slides showed a story that I think is kind of uh, fitting to the, the, the actual situation, but uh, you know, I took some liberties in, in making it a story. Um, but in my opinion, the digital house that advertising built is not very good. Uh, for consumers, um, it has had as a consequence kind of bad media, clickbait, outrage culture, because we want those clicks, we want those interactions, we want those page views and, 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 and all the rest of it. We want to incentivize addictive behaviors for the same reasons. And there's been an erosion of privacy due to the hoarding of data. For marketers, uh, there was really too little focus on brand building, kind of a data paralysis, uh, a lot of waste, uh, the interpretation of, of results based on bad incentives and, and data doesn't, um, you know, doesn't mean that you're going to spend money in the right places. And then uh, there is a lot, a lot, probably more than anyone here realizes uh, of, of fraud and robots that, uh, that, that cause more waste. waste. Um, in the publishing business, um, there's a lot of clickbait, a lot of outrage, um, a lot of quantity over quality. Um, and to, to make that worse, uh, the, the business model for, for a lot of publishers is really to buy clicks cheaply to their website and then sell uh, those visitors more expensively to, to, to advertisers. So again, there needs to be a delta between those two, um, which means almost by definition that the clicks that they are buying needs to include um, not real humans. 
uh, robots, fraud, whatever. In some cases, it's 100%. In other cases, it's a smaller percent. But usually it in, in includes some just because of the way that the economics work. Uh, this pure play fraud is an additional considerable percentage of, uh, of spend. Um, there are a lot of networks that have that have set up fraudulent websites that are doing things in one way or another. Um, but um, near fraud, things like putting invisible ads that are never seen by anyone on pages and so on, were even higher. Um, besides the quality media and even them to some extent, the industry are really content farms with mostly a robot audience. So this is not a very good state of play, in my opinion. So, uh, all of that considered, uh, who likes tracking anymore? I think the answer is Google, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, Apple, a few other players. Um, and perhaps you have some questions about Apple there, but I think it's very clear that they do like tracking. It's just they don't like other people to do it. They see it as a competitive advantage. Um, other stakeholders, perhaps not so much anymore for a lot of reasons, or, you know, maybe they're not entirely aware, but these could be reasons why they, they wouldn't like it so much. Um, I think marketers are confused. A lot of data doesn't add up. Uh, things that show conversions don't actually add additional business. Attribution models can kind of say what we want them to say. Uh, if you've had a play around with these things, uh, you know, you can pick different models. Um, you can have different settings that... Uh, mean different strategical things. This is not uh, the exact science that, that people make it out to be. There's too much fraud, too many bad publishers. Um, it's, it's, it's very maddening. Uh, publishers are kind of burned out because of the tracking, the, the content farms, the walled gardens, and outright fraud is eating up budgets. The quality media cannot really survive on advertising revenue alone. A lot of them kind of gave up. Audiences don't really know to trust. They're overloaded with content and addicted to stimuli. Uh, advertising kind of sucks, uh, and it's mostly ignored unless it demands attention, which makes the problem even worse. People are also very worried about their privacy. Um, kind of starting with, with Snowden and Russiagate and various data leaks and, and just the general awareness of privacy issues, uh, regulators have started to pay attention, and they have made some progress on legislation. Uh, some private companies also have smartly made use of, um, of, of, of this issue as a, as a competitive advantage. Um, um, and so that, that has, that has uh, caused some progress, uh, but it's um, uh, yeah, mainly to say here that, uh, that you know, they also don't like tracking. Um, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? I think this is, uh, this is much more interesting. Um, I think one way to look at this is to say, how did we used to do advertising, tracking, measurement of results before all of this in online, in the internet happened? I think everyone is kind of aware that in, in politics, media, corporate governance, many other areas, um, things used to be slower. Um, the same for advertising. Um, we looked at results for a longer term. We, we, we planned based on, on, on intuitions and data that are perhaps more relevant. So uh, one of the things that we did is we planned advertising based on media titles that had certain audiences. There was kind of an alignment of incentives because quality media attracts clear segments of people. Marketers had trust in their media buys. Consumers had trust in their publishers. Publishers had trust in their income to some extent, to the extent that's possible. Um, and we, in some uh, places, looked at results with statistics. For instance, looking at incremental sales uh, through awareness studies and so on. Um, and that, in my opinion, was really a much healthier way to do this. And um, just on a small tangent, one of the other things that, uh, that, that we used to do very well and that people have started to realize again later on uh, in the years of the internet is that we used to tell stories, we used to entertain, we used to give value. Um, this is a great ad from, from David Ogilvy, but uh, there are many of that uh, era that, um, that could serve as very good inspiration for, uh, for, for things these days. So I think the kind of headline here is focus on quality, trust, and statistics, kind of going back to the old days. 
Um, again, allow me to go on a little tangent because I think that tracking and the interpretation of data has a, a huge influence on the way that you conduct your, um, your advertising and the other way around. And I believe that uh, it's good for some background to just revisit this slide that you're probably familiar with. Um, advertising works um, in this way. We increase or maintain sales and margins, and we do that by increasing the chance that people will choose your brand. We do that by making the brand easy to think of and easy to buy, and by creating positive feelings and associations. We do that via broad reach ads that find a lot of people um, that uh, have uh, content that people find relevant and enjoyable. And we employ targeted activation ads that they find relevant and useful. So these are the two areas, broad reach brand, targeted activation. We forgot about the broad reach ad and I think that is a major mistake in, in online advertising. At the same time, uh, it's also important to remember that customer journeys are not linear. So a lot of marketers think like, okay, um, you know, I see an ad, people uh, go to a landing page, they view the pricing, they sign up and I get some money out of it. And, and, and thus it's entirely logical that I look at what conversions, what last touch conversions or whatever has been brought by my advertising. But this is not how customers actually work. They've probably seen a ton of different places. They've looked at reviews, if it's a high involvement thing. If not, they, they might uh, have heard of you in different places, Googled you quickly, went to your website and signed up or do it on a different device. Like it's not a linear process. And so we should stop thinking about this in a linear way. Your data also does not say what you think it does or what most people think it does. How many times I've had this conversation? Um, still going to have it one more time with all of you. Um, example data, okay? This is not real, but uh, uh, three different systems. What your channel report says. So let's say we add up all of the data from Google, Facebook, uh, from Search Console or Google Analytics, from your re retargeting vendor. Uh, from your direct display, ad server, or whatever, we'll get a certain number of conversions, but uh, there's going to be a ton of overlap in that. And if we look at, for instance, your CRM, which would have actual orders, uh, we'll see a lot less conversions. But also, because of the limitations of your CRM and a, a whole bunch of other things, we won't know exactly what channel they came from. And if, if we do have some better idea, if we fix this, then still it's it's limited. And then if you look at attribution, it says something completely different. Uh, some have been assisted. You could put some formulas on this to say, give this value to the one that has touched it last or give this value to, to, uh, to a channel that has touched the conversion first. But you're still kind of playing around with data. And how do you interpret all of this? How do you make decisions? It, really, you need to kind of put blindfolds on to, to, to make useful decisions here. Um, and uh, and sort of accept the the very uh, major downsides. Your data is also too short term. So uh, this is from a major study that I've forgot to source, but um, suffice it to say, uh, if you already do attribution model, you're, you're modeling that's um, including, I believe, last uh, touch you're only measuring a small percentage of, uh, of the total results of, of advertising. If you then add on short-term econometrics, you'll, you'll get some more. But um, the only way to really get to the bottom of this is longer-term studies, statistical analysis, and so on, marketing mix modeling. And that is really the point here. It's um, that uh, we have different systems for different purposes, different types of measurements for different purposes. And I'll talk about that more later. Uh, your ads are probably not creative enough. This is just kind of a cherry picked uh, um, data point um, and an ad that I like. Uh, but uh, I think all of the incentives of online advertising has made it such that you focus on a lot of the wrongs um, of the, of the wrong numbers, on the wrong KPIs. 
And because of this, there's a drive to make ads more annoying, more interactive, click more, so on and so on, convert more, but you're not actually doing the thing that drives the most additional business. Um, this chart shows, uh, it's already from a few years ago, the number of people that agree with the statement, nearly all TV advertising annoys me, but you can bet that it's even worse for, for online advertising. You'll see it's a, uh, a curve strongly upwards. I think this ad is, uh, is very appropriate for a few reasons. Uh, again, my piece about uh, humans plus robots, uh, computers can't cry. This is a beautiful ad. For, uh, for, for an advertising agency a long time ago, talking about exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you need more than just data, you need interpretation. Another problem, uh, a lot of uh, advertising campaigns is that you probably don't spend enough on brand building. Um, so the way that uh, uh, Binet and Field and, and others have, have shown the effects of, of your advertising campaigns is that uh, the really the only difference, uh, sorry, we do almost, we do all of our advertising to get a return in the end, right? So it's it's kind of um, uh, the distinction between brand and activation advertising or brand and conversion advertising is kind of um, irrelevant. And the thing that is relevant is really the timeline over which you're willing to look to make a return. Um, for shorter term, uh, most people, uh, and because of the way that the data is, would focus on doing sales activations or conversion work. And for uh, with a longer term outlook, you will most likely focus more on, on brand building. This is the way that the returns will look. In the beginning, if you're starting to do brand building, you're probably not going to get a huge amount of, of, of return on that, but it, it adds up over time and you're building up a pool of, of goodwill, a pool of, of business that will provide a better return over time. The um, uh, uh, the general, uh, and this varies per industry or per case, but the general advice is to spend about 60% of your budget on brand building and 40% on, on activation and everything in between. Uh, the, I think, interesting thing here is that if you had only short-term data, so for instance, that, that first six months, you would not know the superior returns that brand building would provide. And that is really the situation that we're in. So again, uh, the title of the presentation was kind of uh, over the top. I think that the better way to put this might be that the future is more than just tracking. We can use tracking data for directional day-to-day -day operations. Like it is not um, efficient or, or possible even to, um, to optimize a line item in your advertising or in your PPC or whatever based on long-term studies. You need to use some kind of data, but don't use it blindly. Don't use it for strategical purposes. And I think that uh, attribution modeling can again be useful for larger companies in medium-term adjustments. And for the longer term, uh, we can move more towards, and for making strategic uh, uh, decisions, we can move more towards the marketing mix modeling um, and related things that don't have to cost a fortune, that you don't need to hire a data scientist for. I mean, you probably should, but you don't need to. Uh, there are lots of tools, and, uh, and, and, and even within Excel, that will allow you to uh, make some very useful um, data analysis. But also, uh, I think we should plan advertising again based on titles and channels and content with quality audiences over uh, other considerations. I think we should start to respect audiences again and advertise with good creative uh, design, things that really align with your brand, things that entertain and people enjoy and find useful. If you do that, good things will come. It's just not entirely right away visible in your data, and that is the problem. Uh, we, as, as, as marketers, have a chance to, uh, to change that situation. Um, we can also use advertising to build brand and not just grab conversions, uh, if it hasn't been entirely clear from the talk so far, um, that I think we should focus more on that. 
then a bit about statistical analysis and, um, and, and, and some ideas here. I think it is a bit beyond the scope to look at specific uh, statistical methods or how to do it. Um, but I think the general idea is that we look at incremental business brought by advertising. So I, I don't know how many of you have had a look at their data in depth and saw, you know, okay, I see 30 conversions on, on this day, but I only see this many. I don't see an increase in my, in my backend systems. Like what, what's going on? Really, the only thing that we're, that we're looking to do strategically in the end as marketers is to increase the, uh, the number of conversions, the business in the short and the long term. And, and the way to measure that is by, uh, um, can do it in a few different methods going from very complicated to, to very simple. But a simple one would be just to test turning off certain campaigns or channels or tactics. Now, you might need to do that for very long to get sufficiently good information. So it doesn't always work if you have lower budget campaigns and so on. But if you're a larger advertiser, try turning off your PPC for a month and see what happens in the short and the long term. This is a far better way to determine um, what incremental business your, your advertising brings than, than just looking blindly at what pixels fired and so on. Without turning anything off, we can also look at the correlation between input and output. Um, how is your advertising spend related to business outcomes? One column with conversions, one column with spend or whatever else you wanna look at. You then just do a simple analysis of, of correlation and perhaps you can even predict future uh, results in this way. This is all possible with Excel and other tools. And uh, I think it's, it's worth looking at again things need more than just blindly finding data from reports. You need humans to interpret it and to, to, to think about stuff. It's complicated. And on that note, um, you should remember that there are very long-term effects. Um, you know, you're, you build up brand equity if you're not a new business. There are macro trends, seasonal trends, competitors that have an effect on your business. There's many more possible influences to data. And trying to unpick every tiny little thing is going to be very, very difficult, as you might have found out. Uh, there's no silver bullet. The stuff, again, is very complicated. But if you start to see your advertising or your marketing more as this black box on the right, media dollars in, or however you want to define that, um, then there is a, a, a black box, and then you have business out. And, and you start to think about ways that you can connect the two. I think you're, you're, you're well on the way. So um, that's um, uh, my presentation for now. I, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, I think we'll have uh, a few minutes to, uh, to take questions and answers if, um, if there is the, uh, the, the moderator um, that is around. Hey, Bart, thank you for that. That's really insightful. Yeah, folks, if you've got any questions, just stick to Bart, uh, use the Q&A tab that is available to you on the right side uh, of the stream. And uh, I'll get us started off, just kind of get it, you know, it warmed up and going. Um, one thing that I kind of noticed was you talking about this idea of, you know, people being less interested in just kind of selling space towards uh, just blind advertising, right? They want more kind of targeted ads. Do, do you think that's a wider direction? Because we still do have a lot of companies that it feels like they put, you know, a hundred million dollars into marketing and it's just like, it's a complete scud approach, right? Just nuke the whole area, get us as many views as possible. Um, yeah. I think one that comes to mind is like Facebook, I think is very good at this, right? You go in with a, a budget and they'll literally let you select all those details. Mm -hmm. Do you expect more platforms to have to take that approach and uh, the money starting to dry up in this just, here's a hundred million, do what you want with it type approach? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think because of the limitations um, that we're starting to see around tracking and so on, um, we've kind of naturally come to the point where behavioral targeting is starting to die off. But I did, never thought it was a good idea to begin with. I, I, I think that um, the, the whole premise here is wrong. Many studies have shown that even something as simple as if someone is a man or a woman is uh, wildly inaccurate. And um, I think we're going to go back to just contextual advertising. Um, yeah. If someone is in a group about 
plumbing businesses, um, you showed them an ad for plumbers. Uh, if you know, um, if if someone is uh, is, is um, uh, reading a magazine about uh, finance, they get an ad for finance. It's not that complicated. We've just really overcomplicated things with terrible data that have eroded the way that the the, the internet works, our privacy, um, many other things that that I've talked about in the in the presentation. So, not a big fan of behavioral targeting. Anymore. That's an interesting idea, right? The the thought that you know for a long time um, we crave individuality. These big marketing platforms have started to think that they need to to cater to that to an extreme. And it's almost mm -hmm. had that reverse result, right? Where people are like, I, I don't want to be put into this box, right? Mm -hmm. I want just a simple answer to my question. You don't need every single element. Um, and I, yeah, I think, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that uh, this is what my slide was kind of about. Like the the reason why we started to do behavioral targeting is because we wanted to take kind of meaning meaningless interactions and monetize them. So again, this person that was reading the New York Times uh, or, or that has an interest in that, if they're doing something else, then we should be able to target them too. And then we can charge more for that than if it was just some meaningless uh, ad that we're showing here. And this, this makes a lot of sense from the ad tech vendors, the Walt, Walt Gardens and a lot of other people. But um, it, it just doesn't take into consideration uh, basic human facts. And uh, I think a lot of people are starting to, 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 to figure that out. Yeah. And we have a question coming in from Kate. She says, uh, what tools would you recommend to focus on for a strategic marketing uh, planning? Um, uh, how, uh, how long is a, is a, is a string <laughs> of... Uh, yeah, it's difficult yeah. to... Look, a, a lot of it depends on uh, what your budgets are. What is the type of ad stack that you can afford? Um, you know, I've, I've seen customers of ours that have the entire Adobe uh, ad stack, for instance, um, that on top of that have uh, business intelligence, statistical uh, uh, statisticians and so on. And they still cannot agree on... Uh, whether or not to give uh, first touch uh, ads uh, any credit or just to give uh, last touch ads any credit. Like, you know, there is a political decision to be made. There is there's so much more work to be done on actually getting the buy-in that I think the, the number one thing that you can focus on rather than tools is to, to as a marketer, as a CMO or whatever, to instill in the company an idea about let's just forget about all of this data and let's just focus on delighting people and, and doing stuff that, that, that looks good, that people find entertaining and that, um, that, that, that focuses on quality. And I, you know, um, so, and then once you start doing that, you can just use whatever tools you already have, like your CRM, Excel, uh, and then there, you know, there are much more complicated tools. So like you can start to work with data studios and stuff like this. It's interesting the point you're making around this whole idea of developing stories, right? Like, you know, the the classic statement around advertising is that good advertising creates uh, memories and invokes emotions, right? It mm. triggers a response further down the line. I, I guess one thought I have is, you know, when we look back at the, the golden age of advertising in that regard, right? I think a lot of people think 80s, 90s, early 2000s. It almost feels like there was uh, less competition for our attention, right? You know, you've got your phone you've got everything on it you've got ads popping up all these websites you can do so much more than you used to be able to is there a concern that you know that approach maybe can't win out because all this information our fingertips means everything's diluted or do you think that that would still power through all of the clutter um it will power through all of the clutter but i think uh uh and and, and because there is a sort of very nasty uh evolutionary um, uh, arms race in that um, the thing that is most addictive, that is most viral, that is most hacking our senses um, is going to be the thing that we're going to be doing. And so something will pop up and that is, that's the same with, with, with all the ads and so on. That being said, I, I think that we're coming to the end of the era, uh, era of, of us trusting, uh, I think we've already passed that, uh, trusting what we read online 
And we're starting to see again, kind of a, a move towards authority in a way. Uh, in some cases, that is a move towards authority with sort of mainstream trusted media. In other cases, and I think that's much more going to be the future, we're going to do one-on-one. -on -one. So kind of um, there is a... Um, uh, there is a specific journalist that has a Substack that we uh, that we follow. There are people that have a podcast that we pay for, uh, things like this. Uh, so I think we are moving more towards trust uh, and uh, and less towards an, uh, the, the explosion of information. Also, and I haven't even talked about that because of the the way that AI is going to just uh, overload us with uh, with 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 content. Yeah, that's the crazy thing, right? We're already seeing, you know, you're seeing streamers, you're seeing YouTube channels pop up where they are essentially completely AI driven and the metrics speak to themselves. They're growing very quickly. So mm -hmm. I, I like the idea that you need to make the experience more personable because the clutter is just going to increase, right? And in theory, that should allow the golden things to kind of shine through. Um, I, I guess like one thought kind of leading in from that is you mentioned this idea of building a brand as opposed to just selling ads. Now, I've noticed some companies kind of leaning into this, right? Like, you know, I do a lot of work in competitive gaming and there's an argument over hey, how they become profitable. And you're seeing some organizations convert their brand value into their own businesses, right? Where they'll create their own energy drink or they'll create their own hardware. Do, mm -hmm. do you think that that is the future for a lot of larger brands where it's essentially kind of keeping you in their network of products as opposed mm -hmm. to just shilling something as a one-off? Yeah, it's interesting. This was uh, this was a conversation that we, as the marketing industry, had uh, a while back about um, you know every company, every brand needs to become a publisher. And um, you know, uh, thinking about this um, in in the broadest possible sense. So you're you're basically building up a community of people. Uh, you're um, you're you're offering different services to that community, and just really the brand is the is the is the connecting factor to to it all. And to some extent, this is really necessary because of this problem with the attention economy that you pointed out. In that, um, you know, if there's just so much going on, the only way that you can really get attention from people is by offering value, giving content, uh, producing experiences, uh, but also through you know the product that you offer that that stand out from 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 competition and from all the other things screaming for our attention. Um, so, yeah, to a certain extent, that's definitely uh, necessary. Uh, that being said, I don't think advertising itself is dead. It's just that we need to start focusing more on creating better stuff. And, you know, if you think, uh, you know, about some of the, the actors, like, uh, what's his name, Ryan? Um, uh, Ryan Reynolds? Yeah, ex yeah, precisely. Knew exactly where you're going, right? The whole, uh, is it a aviation gin, I believe, is one of his big things? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, he built up like six different brands in in the in the last couple of years. He just sold, uh, or at least part of uh, he was part owner of a mobile uh, provider in the U.S. for for a few billion. Um, you know, the only thing that he was really doing is attaching his brand to the company brand, but doing so in a way that is very entertaining and enjoyable for people, and they kind of have a stake in the, in that success and. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's kind of applying the same lesson uh, of, of being a publisher, of you know, focusing on attention rather than hacking attention. Gotcha. Uh, we got a question coming in from Natalia. She says she loves the presentation, very much on point. Uh, she'd like to ask about Google Analytics. Uh, she mm -hmm. knows it's not allowed in Denmark anymore. Is there an alternative? And what kind of tools do you use as an alternative in your work? Ah. Very good question. Um, so we're actually, uh, you know, we have an office in Denmark. We have a lot of Danish companies. And so I'm very familiar with this specific situation. And actually, it's been clarified that Google Analytics is still allowed. It's just about the uh, specific implementation. Uh, that being said, um, we have ways of uh, making um, the um, analytics platforms as well as the tracking pixels, even though <laughs> Uh, you know, it has its limitations, as I pointed out, uh, completely compliant and able to run uh, server side and, 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 um, and you'll be able to gather all of that data that, uh, that you're hungry for. Um, in terms of alternatives, you can start to think about Matomo, but uh, really uh, GA4, if you implement it in the proper way, uh, you set up uh, GTM with, um, 
with uh, with server side, uh, um, uh, then um, then I think you're 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 there, uh, and it's uh, it's not that difficult. Okay. Yeah. Well, I th I think uh, that about rounds us up. Uh, it was really insightful. I'm just going to put this back up on screen for people. So if you want to get in contact with Bart, there's his details. I'm sure he's willing to field any additional questions you might have. Um, but we won't take up any more of your time. I know it's getting around lunchtime. Some of us want to go get a little bit of something to eat. So uh, I'll just say thank you, Bart. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I look forward yeah. to hearing more from you in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone.